Well guys, it was a tight race. A tight race between our two final books, Refugee and Belly Up. It came down to a 30 minute extra voting session from 2.30 to 3. And I only gave these two options and the votes went to Belly Up. So we will be starting Belly Up. If you want to read Refugee, definitely read it on your own, but we are going to be reading Belly Up for our read aloud. So let's get started on our first chapter. Henry Goes Belly Up. I'd just been busted for giving the chimpanzees water balloons when I first heard something was wrong at Hippo River. Large Marge was the one who caught me. No surprise there. Larger Marge O'Malley was a security guard, but all she did most days was follow me around waiting for me to cause trouble. I saw her slinking after me all the time. She'd always try to hide behind rocks and trees and stuff, but it was never hard to spot her because Marge was built like a rhinoceros. Ooh, I hope people don't describe me like that. It's not a very nice way to describe someone. You're in big trouble this time, Teddy, she snarled. She was making a big show of apprehending me in front of a crowd of tourists, shoving me up against the rail of the chimp exhibit, frisking me for weapons, like I was a mugger in some urban back alley instead of a 12-year-old boy at Fun, Fun Jungle, the newest, most family-friendly theme park in the world. Why don't you arrest some real criminals for once, I ask. Right now, you're the only person I see making trouble. That's just because you're not paying attention. It was true. Half the park guests broke the rules. There were signs posted everywhere telling them not to feed the animals or bang on the glass at the exhibits or harass them in any way, but they did it anyways. Only 10 feet from where Marge was patting me down, an entire family was pelting a baby chimp with peanuts. They weren't really trying to feed it, which would have been bad enough. The animals had very restricted diets to keep them from getting sick. They were laughing every time they hit it. Watch this, the dad said. I'll bet I can hit him right in the head. Right as he was about to let fly, though, a huge red water balloon sailed out of the, of the chimp exhibit and nailed him in the face. It exploded on contact, drenching him. Before he could recover, another water balloon hit him, and another, and another. The chimps were fighting back, just as I'd, as I'd hoped. That's why I'd armed them. If the security guards weren't going to protect the animals, then I figured I ought to help the animals protect themselves. After all, how would you like it if someone banged on your window and chucked peanuts at you all day? Within seconds, the whole chimpanzee troop was lobbing balloons, howling with delight as they pelted the family from all sides. The family stumbled about, slipping in the water and sputtering for air, and now everyone was laughing at them. Well, everyone but large Marge, who was born without a sense of humor. She whipped out her radio and alerted headquarters. HQ, this is O'Malley. We have a water balloon situation at the Monkey Mountain. I've apprehended the perpetrator, Mr. Theodore Fitzroy, but I need backup. Marge always spoke like she'd seen way too many cop movies. Never mind that, the dispatcher res responded. Get over to Hippo River. We're getting reports that something's gone wrong there. Marge frowned, though not out of concern for the hippos. She was annoyed her request for backup had been ignored. I don't think you appreciate the magnitude of the situation here. This is coming straight from Buck, the dispatcher said, meaning Buck Grassley, the chief of Fun, Fun Jungle Security. Hippo Redder River is a code red. If you're at Monkey Mountain, you're the closest to the scene, so get over there now. Marge snapped upright, jammed her radio back in its holster. The idea that there was an actual emergency had stirred something inside her. She grabbed my ear and dragged me towards the exit. Don't think this saves your bacon, mister. You're still in trouble for what you did to that poor family. That family ought to thank me, I told her. If I hadn't given the chimps water balloon, they'd have thrown poop. I wasn't making that up. I'd seen the chimps defend themselves in the wild by throwing their own feces. But as usual, trying to explain anything to Marge was useless. Watch your language or I'll wash your mouth out with soap, she snapped. The family that had been bombarded by the balloon stormed out of Monkey Mountain right behind us, so soaked their shoes were sloshed, their, their shoes sloshed. See if I ever come to this park again, the mother announced indignantly. Good riddance, I thought, stifling a smile. The truth was, except for Marge's vice grip on my ear, I was happy to be heading to Hippo River. I wasn't sure what code red meant, but it promised to be interesting. Maybe some clumsy tourists had fallen into the exhibit and needed to be rescued. 
Technically, that was probably a bad thing to hope for. Most people don't realize that hippos are actually the second most dangerous African animal. Water, bu water buffaloes are the first. They're mean, they're unpredictable, and they have razor-sharp razor teeth a foot long. In the wild, they've been known to stomp lions to death and bite crocodiles in half. If someone fell into the hippo's territory, they'd be messed up. But after a few weeks at Fun Jungle, I was bored out of my skull and willing to take excitement anywhere I could find it. That might seem pretty surprising, given that I'd spend every day at a place that claimed to be America's most exciting family vacation destination. Fun Jungle was the biggest, most elaborate zoo ever built, and it had been jam-packed since it opened two weeks before. But unlike the thousands of other kids who visited every day, I didn't go home when they closed the park at night. I was home. Both my parents worked here. My mom was a famous gorilla re researcher. My dad was a renowned wildlife photographer. They'd met when National Geographic had sent him to photograph mom, mom's gorillas. Now mom oversaw the care and research at, of all fun jungle primates, while dad worked for the publicity department, taking glamor shots of the animals for the websites and magazines. Fun jungle had been built way out in Texas Hill County and Texas Hill Country, where land was cheap. The closest city, San Antonio, was more than half an hour away, so the park had provided housing for my family and a few of the other animal specialists who had come to work there. Our mobile home sat just behind the back fence. None of the other specialists had children, though, which meant I was the only kid for 30 miles in any direction. Now, don't go thinking I was bored because I don't because I don't like animals. I do. In fact, I bet I know more about animals than any 12 year olds you've met. I spent the first decade of my life living in a tent in the African Congo. I didn't see a TV until I was six. Instead, I watched animals and mom and dad taught me everything they knew. I learned how to track elephants, communicate with chimps and defend myself against a hungry leopard. Man, I heard about animals you've probably never even heard of. Bongos, hammer cops, gaboon vipers, Gueno, Guenons. My first friend was a gorilla my age main, named Mufuzi. I loved being around animals every day. I was bored because n until, not, until not long ago, I had an amazingly exciting life. Living in the Congo was one incredible experience after another. And when I did leave the jungle, it was always to visit fascinating places with my father on his assignments. Dad was a real adrenaline junkie and he encouraged me to embrace adventure. We'd repelled into caves to find giant bats in Mexico, stalked tigers in Uttar Pradesh, and even snor snorkeled with blue whales in Fiji. But then, af right after I turned 10, a civil war broke out in the Congo and my parents decided it was no longer safe to raise me there. If not for me, they probably would have risked their lives to stay with the gorillas. Mom grabbed the first job she could find back in the States, a research position at Emory Primates Lab in Atlanta. But that was a bust. None of us was happy in Georgia. We all missed Africa's ter Africa terribly. So when my folks were offered work at Fun Jungle, which billed itself as the closest you can get in America to being in a safari, we figured living there might be more fun for all of us. And for a while, it was. Fun Jungle was, the far, was by far the best zoo in the world. All the reviews said so. It was three times larger than the next biggest zoo. Its exhibits were innovative and there was plenty to do, but it still wasn't the Congo. And after a few weeks to keep, after a few weeks to keep myself amused, I'd had to resort to, prank, to playing practical jokes, like giving the chimps water balloons or switching the signs on the men's and women's restrooms or replacing all the black jelly beans in the large Marge, in large Marge's lunch with rabbit poop. That's why I was fine with letting myself be dragged along to Hippo River. I was only hoping for a little excitement. It never occurred to me that Henry would be dead. It didn't occur to Marge either. She shoved through the crowd at the at Mabuko Hippo Overlook, still dragging me by my ear, flashing her little tin badge, and suddenly there Henry was lying in the shallow water of his enclosure all four legs pointed straight at the sky. Most of Henry, and there was about 4,000 pounds of him, was underwater resting at the bottom of his pool. I couldn't see his body since the water was clouded with hippo poop as usual. Only his feet were visible, jutting above the surface, pale white now that the blood had drained from them. They were thick and stubby and looked like giant moldy marshmallows floating on in day-old hot chocolate. 
Isn't that cute? A mother asked her children. Henry's sleeping upside down. Marge's grip finally relaxed on my ear. She was so stunned she forgot she'd forgotten about me. Instead, she stared at Henry vacantly, not knowing what to do. She wasn't the only one. There was, a, there was always a crowd at Hippo Overlook, but today it was more packed than usual. Maybe word had gotten out that Henry had kicked the bucket and some folks had come running to see, but most of the visitors appeared to have been caught by surprise. They stood there, gaping at those feet, unable to believe that Henry the Hippo was dead. I admit, I was pretty shocked myself. Since Fun Jungle had more than 5,000 animals on display, you'd expect things would go wrong now and then. Every day, dozens of animals got sick. Maybe even one or two of them would die. But for Henry to go belly up? That was pretty much the worst case scenario, given that he was the park's mascot. Fun Jungle had been advertising all over the world for a year before it opened, and every one of those ads every TV commercial, radio spot, and billboard featured Henry. Well, not the actual Henry, but a cartoon version of him who said corny things like, come f visit Fun Jungle, it's more fun than a barrel of monkeys, and I ought to know. Cartoon Henry didn't look much like real Henry. He was skinny, purple, and friendly, while the real Henry was fat, gray, and mean. But that didn't seem to bother the tourist. Henry was famous, so they flocked to see him. It was bizarre. There was a far more interesting hippo, Henrietta, in the exhibit right next to Henry's, but most guests didn't give her a second glance. Henrietta could have done backflips and everyone would still be packed 10 deep to watch Henry nap. Wake up, Henry, it's time to get up, a little boy near me yelled. Several other boys decided this was a good idea and joined in. Their parents looked at one another blankly. Cartoon Henry had told them all had told them all that a day at Fun Jungle was supposed to be nonstop family fun, explaining the circle of life and death threatened to be quite the opposite. Explaining the circle of life and death threatened to be quite the opposite. Johnny, please, said one mother. Her son was happily proving he could chant the loudest. I don't think Henry is going to wake up. Hippos are very sound sleepers. That's right, a queasy looking father added. Plus, his ears are underwater. Hippo River was the most popular exhibit in Fun Jungle, though this wasn't only because of Henry. It was right by the main entrance, the first thing visitors saw as they came through the front gates. And it was spectacular, as it should have been. I heard Fun Jungle had spent more than $30 million on it. The exhibit took up 10 acres, and once you entered it, it was really like being in Africa. You started at a thundering 150-foot waterfall, then hiked through a jungle filled with birds and monkeys, visiting scenic viewpoints from which you could see flocks of flamingos, huge Nile crocodiles, and of course, the hippos. Each viewpoint had a quaint name that had been designed by a computer to sound African, even though it meant absolutely nothing. Gondongo Gorge and Labasi Basin, Wolaman Camp. The real draw at Hippo River, however, was the underwater viewing area, places where you could watch the hippos through, a huge, glass through huge glass walls. This wasn't a revolutionary idea. Lots of zoos had similar exhibits for viewing pop polar bears, and a few even had ones for hippos, but no one had anything on the scale that Fun Jungle did. The folks who designed Fun Jungle were actually pretty smart about animals. They knew hippos were far more interesting below water than they were above it. Man, a lot of the time, and I know this from experience, you can watch the surface for hours and never even see a hippo. They need to breathe only once every 10 minutes, and even then, they usually just poke their nostrils out. But underwater, it's a whole different story. Hippos swim, play, eat, give birth, and nurse their young at river bottoms. Mom told me they always make make baby hippos down there, but Fun Jungle kept Henry and Henrietta separated during visiting hours to make sure this didn't happen in front of the guests. Plus, while hippos look like big, lazy fat sacks of fat on land, they're surprisingly graceful in the water. So Fun Jungle had eight gigantic windows to view them through, and even a pricey restaurant where the prime tables were right against the glass. Guests could have a $14 hamburgers and watch hippos swim past a foot away. You can't do that in Africa. Unfortunately, there had been a few glitches with the exhibit. 
Most obviously, the water filtration system wasn't strong enough. Henry ate nearly 100 pounds of food a day and sent most of it straight through his digestive tract, clouding the water faster than the filters could clean it. If Henry stayed near the windows where the water flowed was better, you could get a, you could get a decent, if somewhat hazy, view of him. But Henry preferred to spend his time in a small backwater in the small backwater of his enclosure, wallowing in his own filth. This rendered the underwater viewing areas all but useless. Restaurant patrons ended up eating their $14 burgers with nothing to see except sewage. Of course, this was now a relatively minor problem. It was June in Texas, which meant it was 98 degrees in the shade. Under the harsh glare of the sun, Henry was starting to smell worse than usual, which really wasn't saying some, was which was really saying something. Hippos are naturally quite flatulent, which means smelly. But Henry was the worst I'd ever encountered. He could emit odors powerful enough to make you nauseated 50 feet away. He's not sleeping, a little girl said, wrinkling her nose in disgust. He's dead. Other parents' eyes widened. The girl's parents immediately shriveled under everyone's gaze. No, he isn't, her mother said hopefully. Hippos don't die like that. When hippos die, they float on the top like goldfish. He's dead, the little girl announced again. Let's go see the elephants, said her father. All the parents thought this was a wonderful idea. Maybe they're still alive, another father said under his breath. None of the kids wanted to leave, though. Those who thought Henry was sleeping were intent on waking him up, and those who suspected he was dead were fascinated. Know how kids sometimes can't help staring at something they're disgusted by, like roadkill? Well, imagine how captivating roadkill the size of a minivan would be. The parents who didn't look squeamish were growing annoyed. Many turned to Marge, expecting that, as the only person in the vicinity wearing a fun jungle uniform, she would do something to address the Henry situation. But Marge just kept staring, slack-jawed, at Henry's corpse. Marge wasn't the best decision maker on normal days. I'd seen her take 10 minutes to decide whether to have fried chicken, but have the fried chicken bucket or the triple nacho grande for lunch. For the record, she ultimately opted for both. Faced with an actual crisis, her brain had apparently overloaded and shut down. Nearby, a teenager dressed in a Henry Hippo costume paced nervously, unsure what to do. His job usually didn't require much thinking. He was essentially supposed to stand still, wave hello, and let tourists take his picture. Mabuko, Overlook, had become selected, had been selected as the best place for this because it offered the most shade. The Henry costume was thick and heavy and had poor ventilation. In the direct Texas sun, it could quickly get over 120 degrees inside. On the first few days the park opened, the Henry portrayers had mistakenly been stationed at, unsh at unshaded Mount Malumbo Point. Two had passed out from dehydration, collapsed on sm collapsing on small children. The actors only had four long four had hour long shifts because they had to drink a ton of water to survive in the suit and would inevitably have to pee. However, their job orders stated that during that hour they were never to leave their posts, no matter what. The Henry on duty now obviously felt he shouldn't be there, lurking around the dead hippo like his ghost, but he didn't want to get in trouble either. An excited family came along, unaware that the real Henry lay dead just across, just around the corner, and positioned their children at the, at the fake Henry's, um, at the fake Henry's feet for a photo. The worried actor fidgeted so nervously that the mother had to steady his hand twice. It seemed someone should take care of this, but since Marge was a basket case that left me. Once the family had taken their picture, I approached the actor and told him, you should probably get out of here. Are you from administration? Henry asked, contor Henry asked, contorting to get a look at me. The costume had been designed so that the actor inside could only see through some gauze in Henry's open mouth, which was angled downwards. It was well suited to prevent the actor from stepping on children, but not for looking people in the face or as had been proved on several occasions, avoiding low-hanging tree branches. Since I was standing outside his range of sight, the actor had no way to tell I was only 12. Yes, I said, now move it before you freak everyone out. Yes, sir. The actor hurried away so quickly, he forgot to watch his feet. He stumbled over a bench and face-planted into the landscaping. 
I shook my head in disgust. Some people have way too much respect for authority. We're going to stop there for our reading today. Come back and check out um, our next reading tomorrow. Sounds like an interesting and intriguing start to our new book, Belly Up.